everyone, and uh, happy last day of classes and everything. So this is talk three out of three, which essentially a report on um, some stuff that you haven't had a chance to study as an undergraduate student, but this stuff is particularly important because it is the foundations of nature, like the most fundamental questions that people are asking right now. And um, I will actually do a review of the first two talks, a very quick review, so if you've missed that, you'll at least be able to get the gist of it. Um, so, generally speaking, um, what I did in the first two lectures was a report on the current state of our understanding. Everything that we talked about in the first two lectures has been experimentally verified multiple times over the decades, so we know that it works. Today, we get into the realm of the hypothetical. How does one combine all of this into one full so-called theory of everything, also known as TOE, T-O-E, theory of everything? So we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about possibilities of experiment and what the future may bring. Unfortunately, the current state of affairs is pretty stagnant. Research in this stuff is ongoing, but there hasn't been like huge breakthroughs in recent years. It's unfortunate. Why? Mainly because of the lack of experimental backup. We have no experiment to tell us whether we're going in the right direction. So, um, when somebody hears the, the term theory of everything, they're thinking, oh, maybe that's, you know, the theory that will finally explain why my girlfriend dumped me, or like, uh, <laughs> why is it that, uh, the, the, uh, what are we doing here, or the pursuit of happiness, all that stuff. No, it's not that kind of theory of everything, and it certainly has no uh, religious implications in any way. It is just a theory that, as I will explain, uh, this is what it is not, the theory of uh, what it is not. So I'll tell you what it is, and in many senses, it is a theory of pure physics, okay? Hopefully, it's a theory that combines all of our fundamental physics understanding into one basic principle, or principles, or collection of principles that are related to each other. Um, it's a theory of all matter particles, it's a theory of all forces, everything that we can observe experimentally or deduct the existence of experimentally. It's hopefully a mathematical theory because apparently that's how nature describes itself via mathematics. You know, there's no reason for it to, but apparently it is. And it has to be falsifiable in the sense that it has to, it has to have within it ways of being proven correct as well as proving proven incorrect. That's what falsifiability usually means. So if you think of it in terms of a hierarchy of, of knowledge, in a sense, so things that are in the bottom are more fundamental than things that are built on it. The, the way, let me define that, because, because usually my fellow colleagues, the chemists and biologists, get mad at me when I say things like this. But in, in a sense, biology works because of chemistry. Right? And chemistry works because of physics, you know, essentially quantum physics of the atom. Uh, medicine works because of biology. Psychology works because of medicine. Economics works, at, it's like a big hierarchy of things. And in that sense, the theory of everything should be at the very bottom. Okay? Some people would put mathematics in here because math is kind of the foundation of, of all of these things. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not, a, it's not an experimental science, it's a formal science, so I don't include it in this list. But that's, it, that is the sense in which a theory of everything is a theory of everything. It's, it's a bottom foundation of all of that stuff. Um, everything works because of toe, in a sense. It is, it is something that people would have, have sought in over centuries. I mean, people have dreamed of finding simple ways to explain everything that we observe in nature. You know, from the from even going as far back as the ancient philosophers and so on, they wanted to simplify things. You know, everything is made of earth, fire, air, and water. For example, that's a simple kind of thing. It's wrong, but it's a simple principle, and that's that's what they wanted to be. If it were true, then that would be it. Theory of everything. There you go. So it's a kind of a reductionist kind of thing. And physicists like to say, we would like to find a theory of everything that is so simple and so concise that it can fit on one side of a t-shirt. You can walk around with it and say, okay, here it is. Um, that is the theory. Is that the fewer the principle is based on, the better. So it's, it's not a new thing. It's an ancient thing. 
And um, it also should be unique. All right, so unique and and I mean, apparently we live in one universe or one existence, let's put it this way. And all of existence seems to work because of the rules of physics that we follow. So the question is, are there multiple possible ways that they, the world that we live in could have existed? And if there is, then we, we get into like uh, unscientific questions as like what determined which system has been chosen or, or, or who or so on. These are not scientific questions, obviously. So we would like our theory of everything to be unique in, in the sense that you look at it and you say it could not be any other way. That's doesn't have to be, but that's the thing that people would like it to be. It is inevitable. I call it the da effect. You, 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 once you get it, you're like, da, how could it be anything else? That kind of thing. Right? So that's, that's what the idea of uniqueness is there. Um, but, you know, if there are other universes, and these other universes happen to be described by different theories of everything, it happens to be, then what we have discovered is not a theory of everything, it's rather a theory of this universe, what I call a tutu theory of this universe. And then there is a next theory of the next universe, and the next theory of the next universe, and every universe has its own laws of physics, but it would be nice that if all of these tutus are actually foundations coming from a single, unique, inevitable toe. That would be nice too. And by the way, apparently that's what we have in string theory. I'll talk about that. So uh, even if there is more than one theory of this universe, then that's, the question still remains. They are not disconnected. They have to be connected to each other somehow. So there must be an underlying theory of everything still to be discovered. So uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, summarize the first two talks. So essentially. Um, because it's important to remember them. So what I'm going to say next is things that I've covered before. Essentially, that apparently the universe seems to be uh, made up of subatomic particles. Um, we've got the particles that make matter, like quarks and leptons and bosons and baryons and fermions and all kinds of classifications, electrons, etc. And these are the core of these are the particles that make up matter in a sense. Okay? And then you've got forces between those particles. You have studied two of them in your in your undergraduate curriculum. You have studied electromagnetic forces in some detail. You've studied gravitational forces if you've taken generativity. Um, but even if you haven't, you've studied it from the Newtonian perspective in classical mechanics. But then, uh, we don't tell you about these last two, which are two forces that only appear inside the nuclei of atoms. They're called, unimaginatively, they're called the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. The reason is obvious. Strong is the strongest one of them. It's the strongest of all forces. If you want to talk in terms of strength, the strong force is the strongest one, followed by electromagnetism, followed by the weak nuclear, and gravity, surprisingly, is the weakest one of all even though it was the first one to be discovered. Uh, but the reason we don't feel these two in our daily lives, and that's why we don't really discuss them too much until you go to grad school, is that uh, they, are, they have a short range. They only work inside the nucleus, while the other two have an infinite range. So, so that's, that's why you don't feel them in your everyday life. Okay. Another question that's come up over the, over the decades is, why four? Why not one force? I mean. Why, why, why is it that nature seemed fit, to coin a phrase, to choose the number four of, of four forces? Well, maybe there aren't four of them. Maybe there is only one, or there can only be one, one force to rule them all, essentially. But uh, for some reason, we're, different, we're seeing different sides of it. Right? Maybe that's the case, especially since we already know that this has already happened historically, at least twice, well, more than, more than twice. For instance, at the time of Newton, he unified the gravitational force you feel on Earth with the same forces that control the celestial uh, orbits of planets. That's a unification, bringing two things together. Um, you studying E and M, you know that at some point, suddenly magnetic fields and electric fields cannot exist without each other. 
they are, in a sense, two sides of the same coin. So that has been discovered before. Maxwell proved this, and um, in an incredibly brilliant theory of, of, of electricity and magnetism, based off on, on, the, on the principle of this unification kind of thing. And of course, if you have taken 450, then you know that all hell breaks loose after Maxwell. You know, essentially, once you unify things, you discover all kinds of weird things. These are the Maxwell equations, not in the form that you know, but this is the Maxwell equations in their simplest form, it's called the differential elements form. These two equations here are Gauss and Ampere. This equation up here is Faraday and no more poles, just bundled up into one notation. The reason I put it up there is to convey to you that it is a simple theory. Simple in the sense that you can write it to fit on one side of a t-shirt. Not simple in the sense that your homeworks are easy. <laughs> Obviously they're not, okay? But simple in that sense. It's a reductionist theory. It's, it's as simple as possible. It is a theory that unifies things. It is the dream that we want for theory of everything, to be like that, to be as simple as this. So one hopes that Toe should be elegant, however that means, but if you ask me, the, this is elegance, simplicity at least the way you formulate things. It should not necessarily mean mathematically simplicity, again, it refers to your homework. It's simply, it's simple, simple in the sense of the basic principles, and the lesser the principles one has to make, uh, or lesser the assumptions one has to make, the better. And then we've got the other force that has been studied, um, um, again, we mentioned it in the previous talk, which is Einsteinian gravity. Um, this is the basic idea is that, um, Apparently, the space and time we live in seems to behave like a, some elastic material. Space-time can bend and curve, in a sense, and objects really travel on shortest distances between two points on that, on that space-time manifold or fabric of space-time, just like dropping uh, a bar of soap in the sink, it kind of spins around, and it's pretty much the same thing how it happens in, in general relativity. And it's also simple and elegant. Right? It can, in fact, be described by only two equations. This is one of them. This is the equation that describes the curvature of space-time. But it is another one uh, called the geodesic equation that describes the motion of objects in the space-time. Both of them are as simple as possible as one can be. So, um, to summarize, um, there is also the standard model, which combines the theories of three of these forces, at least, into one big quantum model based on quantum field theory. And we've discussed that in the previous um, talk. The standard model hypothesized at first that there are particles that are responsible for the transfer of these forces. And we talked about that before. Even gravity is included in the list. Um, one assumes that there is a gravitone, a quantum of the space-time, but uh, uh, that has not been experimentally verified yet. You remember from the previous talk, the idea is based on the so-called Feynman diagrams where um, instead of measuring invisible fields between particles, you can essentially imagine the exchange of particles. So if these are two electrons, uh, to repel each other, they could replace a single photon, exchange a single photon. And if that happens a large number of times with much more complicated diagrams, you get the overall effect that you see in the motion of, of charged particles. Um, this is the basic idea of the standard model, that it's based on these uh, Feynman diagrams of these ideas that particles carry the forces. Um, it is a little complicated. I mean, it unifies things in a sense, in a sense, that all these theories are based on basic principles of quantum mechanics, plus basic principles of special relativity, plus a little bit of something called group theory. So the foundations of it are simple enough to be called kind of elegant. But to this day, it's kind of weird because Oh, we have so many particles, and it's not immediately obvious why there are so many particles, and what most of these particles are doing anyway. They just appear and disappear in, in vacuum without contributing anything to our everyday lives. So what, what's the purpose, if you want? Um, so the, 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 the elegance of Maxwell and Einstein is, at this point, a little lost. The theories can be described mathematically, but not simple enough to be placed on a t-shirt. If, you're, if, you're, if you remember um, your studies in classical mechanics and you remember something called the Lagrangian, if you write down the Lagrangian for the standard model, it's like, a, like six pages long. So 
that's not going to fit on a t-shirt unless you write it microscopically. So standard model is not quite unified. It's just a collection of theories. It explains the theories that we call electromagnetism, strong and nuclear. <laughs> Gravity is excluded. It has other issues. Even though, like I mentioned in the second talk, it is actually the most successful physical theory yet in the sense that every prediction that it makes uh, comes up in the lab to within like one part of a billion, correct? That, that's very accurate. So a theory making a prediction and that prediction is verified in the lab with such accuracy is just amazing. That's why we call it the most successful theory. But it has some issues like um, weird kinds of infinities and singularities that pop up. You do a calculation and equations blow up in your face. Uh, people have learned to deal with them, kind of essentially sweep them under the carpet. You're familiar with one of these issues, for example. Uh, ordinary Coulomb's law. It's an inverse square law. So you use it to calculate the electric field everywhere except at the point r equals zero. Because you'll be dividing by zero. Right? We ignore it, even though the particles are point particles. And it's a reasonable question to ask. What is the electric field right on the particle? It's infinite. We ignore that. We do the calculations. gives us correct answers. But there is still an issue there. The infinities that appear in, in, in the standard model are similar to this. It's because you're treating particles as point particles. So you can ignore it, and you can get the predictions, but they're still there. And if you want to understand nature, you better get a theory that doesn't have any anomalies in it. That's the idea. Um, so that brings us to the topic we have today. A theory that combines everything. Gravity, electromagnetism, explains all the particles, and so on. A theory of everything, a GOE, and, um, well, there's only one. Only one theory that anybody has ever proposed that combines all the forces of nature, all the particles of nature, in one model with reasonably good consistency. Not too many problems. That's why it has been called by Sheldon Glashow, the famous physicist, the only game in town. Not because it's true, but because nobody has come up with anything better. Um, that's why we call string theory. It's more than 40 years old. Uh, it was first proposed in 1969, so that's 40, 55 years old. Um, and uh, in terms of unification, yes, it includes everything. It has had many different revisions. Um, most of the infinities that appear in the standard model just go away. They, 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 they're not there anymore. And here's the basic premise that was stumbled upon. Apparently, the theory proposes that all subatomic particles, including the force particles, like photons and so on, are not really point particles. They are made up of little, small, really, really small, 10 to the negative 33 centimeters small filaments of energy, strings, which we call today super strings. And they come into two varieties. There are open strings and there are closed strings, loops. Okay? And here's the attraction of this. If you assume that they are traveling at the speed of light, which almost anything massless is, and they're vibrating, oscillating, just like a string of a violin, if these uh, oscillations are made quantum mechanical, if they are quantized, if they are made into like operators instead of functions and so on, out comes a description of possible particles. String oscillating in one way, you see a photon. Oscillates in another way, you see an electron. Same string. Oscillates in a third way, you see a quark. And so on. In other words, complete unification. That's the beauty of the idea. The frequency of the oscillation is what distinguishes a particle from another. All our string, same rules of interaction, except that what we observe would look different. So instead of talking about point particles like quarks inside a proton, for example, you're really talking about three strings that happen to interact following certain rules. Remember this diagram? The problem with this kind of interaction, which appears in the standard model, is that because every particle is treated as a point particle, you get those infinities. The infinities particularly appear at these points where the three lines meet. They're called vertices. But in the case of strings, 
they are no longer points. And the vertices are no longer points. It's a smooth interaction. Instead of saying two particles exchanging something and then moving away, you're talking about two strings who momentarily combine and then move away. And the diagrams are replaced from point diagrams and straight lines to things that look like this. Sheets and tubes and so on. This kind of smoothness compared to this one is what eliminates the infinities. The infinities are gone completely. And that's, that's, that makes it make, make, make people like sit up and pay attention. Because the infinities were a problem with the initial standard model. So, this is wonderful. Everything is included. Even a graviton is there. One of the possible oscillatory modes of that string. You know, just like the harmonic modes you learn from the strings on violins, but they're quantum mechanical. Um, includes a graviton, which is the particle that people have predicted must have certain properties to be a particle of gravity. Okay? The infinities are gone. Somewhat of the elegance of the ideas has been restored, in a sense. Okay? Because even though we don't have a single set of equations, we at least have a single set of fundamental principles. Everything is string, there are certain symmetries called supersymmetries, and everything can be summarized on one side of the t-shirt. So, do we have a winner? Of course not. I mean, if we did, then that would be big news. Um, there are much, many problems, and they're problems of a different type. That's, that's the bottom line here. For example, strings are predicted to be extremely small. Planck length small, and to the negative 33 centimeters. That is way beyond our ability to observe in the lab. You remember from the second talk, I told you about particle accelerators where you're colliding things together. And the larger the particle accelerator, the faster you can collide things, the deeper you can probe in matter. Right? Remember this? Now, to make a particle accelerator that would be able to accelerate particles so fast that you would be able to probe the size of the string, you need a particle accelerator, literally, the circumference of the galaxy. I'm not joking. Somebody calculated that. So, direct observation of those strings is impossible. We need indirect So it predicts also a large number of particles that we haven't seen in the lab. Supersymmetric particles, for example, which I mentioned briefly last time, uh, are predicted by string theory. An infinite power of successively more vibrating strings. It's like when you look at the harmonic oscillations of a, of a, of a string that we teach in, in, in intro physics, there are infinite harmonics. This is the ground state, the first state, the second state, and you can go up as high as you want. Same thing with, with these. The strings can oscillate in any harmonic you want, which means an infinite tower of particles that nobody's ever seen. So, <laughs> it's elegant, but it's problematic. Furthermore, there is a very interesting problem with string theory that's opened up a whole can of worms. String theory demands a certain number of space dimensions to live in. That's never happened before. Every theory in physics that you study or anybody's ever studied can work in three dimensions, can work in two dimensions, can work in four dimensions. You just adjust the equations any way you like. Right? Sometimes we solve things in one dimension because it's easier. Right? And then we generalize to three dimensions. String theory says I'll have none of that. String theory requires a specific set of dimensions that happens to be ten spatial dimensions plus an extra dimension of time. Ten. Now the story is longer than this. First, there were 26 space time dimensions. Then we worked in the theory a little bit, reduced it down to 10 space time dimensions. But now we believe there should be 11 space time dimensions. So 10 spatial and one of time. That's weak because we only live in three space plus time. And what happens if I require the theory to work in the ordinary three space time dimensions? Everything collapses. Energy conservation goes away. Lorentz invariance is violated. Um, all physics essentially collapses. It can only work in a specific number of dimensions. So what do we do? Throw it out? Of course not. We try to find a way out of the problem. We say, maybe 
the extra dimensions are so small that we can't see them in our everyday lives. What does that mean exactly? I'll give you an example. Look at this. This is a line, right? Before you bring in the, the lens, it's a line. How many dimensions is a line with zero thickness? One. One dimension. Just the x axis. But if you enlarge it and you find that it's not a line, it's just a very thin cylinder. That means that there's an extra dimension. You can go around. That's what I mean when I say extra dimensions. The surface of a cylinder is two dimensional, but one dimension is hidden. Why? Because it's so small, you don't feel it. This is a me, this is a plane, a two-dimensional plane. But at every point, there may be two extra dimensions that are wrapped around in a very small spheres. But I have seven extra dimensions in string theory. I need something much more complicated than a circle or a sphere. I need weird geometrical objects that have to satisfy certain amounts of conditions in order for it to agree with the physics that we observe. And um, mathematicians and physicists have spent a long time studying what kind of surface it needs to exist in order for string theory to be consistent and wrap up the extra dimensions, make them extremely small. You hear terms like calabiao and all kinds of weird, different things. They're not as simple as a circle or a sphere. A lot of people's efforts went into studying these dimensional manifolds that get rid of the extra dimensions by proposing that they're just so small. So the idea is this. I'm walking around. Every single particle in my body is made up of a string. But the string is so small, and these surfaces are so small, that the string, as I move, is also spinning around those extra dimensions in addition to moving with me in the third dimension. And I can't detect this because everything is very, very small. Okay? It's a way out. Okay? But <laughs> when you try and dimensionally reduce things on complicated things like that, the theory changes. You start with a the theory in 11 space-time dimensions, and you wrap up the extra seven and bring them down to four space-time dimensions, you find that you can do this in 10 to the power of 500 different ways. That's an estimate, obviously, because nobody's ever written down such a huge number of theories. Each one of those different ways of wrapping down from 11 down to 4 gives different laws of nature. To be a little technical, you start with the 11-dimensional Lagrangian, and you wrap it around some complicated seven-dimensional figure, you get 10 to the 500 possible Lagrangians, each one of them describing different sets of laws of nature. What have we found here? Apparently, we have found tutus, not toes. We have found a theory that proposes 10 to the 500 possible universes. Which one of all of this lives that we live in is a big question that hasn't been uh, discussed yet. Here is, here's a comparison of some numbers just to understand how big this 10500 number is. This is the number of cells in the human body. This is the number of seconds since the beginning of the universe. This is the number of hydrogen atoms in the universe. And this is the number of possible theories that you can come out of string theory. Good luck. Right? I have counted them. This is 500 years. Okay. I have sat down and counted them. So, maybe, yeah, okay, so what? So, we found, what, 10 to 500 possible tutus? They still come from one toe, right? From one string theory. Even though um, we happen to live into one of those possible theories. They're all different. They all give me different forces. They all give me different things. Um, it's a problem. Uh, the proponents of the theory, and this is three of them, uh, Joe Polchinski is no longer with us, rest in peace, but Ed Witten and Joe Molesena are famous string theorists. Ed Witten is sometimes referred to as the smartest guy alive. He's won the Fields Medal in Mathematics, which is the Nobel Prize of, of Math. The only physicists to do so. He, he, all of them, um, have, they still like string theory, even with all these problems, the extra dimensions, the, the extra theories that we don't understand. Um, but it answers a lot of questions. It's the only proposal. It's the only game in town. It's got some interesting mathematics. I mean, some people have even gone as far as saying, if nature hadn't chosen string theory to describe itself, then something must be wrong with nature. 
because this is so elegant, so beautiful, and so consistent that it must be true, according to some arguments. Now, of course, we don't do physics based on elegance alone, but uh, it's the only game in town. Nobody knows of any other idea that seems to work, even mathematically. So what do we do? We just have to go on and keep patching it up, and that's what the opponents say. They say, you guys need a particle accelerator the size of the galaxy to, f to prove what you're doing. It's not going to happen. You're wasting your time. Your theory cannot be proven. Right? It cannot be made proven or, or disproven. Um, they think it's not unique because of the appearance of this very large number of possibilities, the 10 to the 500. People have written books about it. These are books that actually attack, direct attack on people working in string theory and telling them that they're wasting government funding on, on things that could go a little bit better. Um, yeah, you, you all say that math is nice and fine, but this is physics, we need experimental uh, chances and so on. Um, Leonard Susskind, one of the uh, famous string theorists, proposed an interesting idea. He said, look, what if the 10500 possible theories actually represent 10 to the 500 possible universes. And that the universe is something that spontaneously can come out of string theory, and if it carries laws of physics that allows it to endure, it will. If it doesn't, then it vanishes, it goes away. In other words, he proposed a theory of evolution of these 10 to the 500 possibilities. It's called the string theory landscape. I know what you're thinking. We are, you know, we're just grasping at straws trying to fix something that has many problems in it. But again, it's the only game in town. And if you have a better idea, string theorists will be happy to hear it. But nothing else seems to work. It's the only one that explains the standard model, that explains gravity altogether in one basic principle. It's the only one that satisfies the basic foundations of what a toe should be. So that's the way it is right now. I mean, we have this large number of possibilities and um, no experimental backing, okay? And of course, they're not, you know, people sometimes are not very happy about this. I'll tell you a little bit more about stuff that appears in string theory. Uh, apparently, in addition to strings, there's something else that comes out of it called the brains. And brains are extended objects. They behave like tidal waves and so on. Um, there are zero brains, there are one brains, there are two brains, there are three brains. Angel and Brian did research with me on zero brains, so they know a little bit more about this stuff. They are objects that appear in string theory and seem to have a purpose, although it's not obvious exactly what it is. Um, some proposals have been advanced that maybe those brains represent universes and we just live in one of them and other universes are parallel universes. It just goes on and on and on. The math is there, the calculations are there, no way to experimentally verify most of these things. Um, let me skip ahead a little bit. So we have the Large Hadron Collider. I talked about that a little bit um, last time. Uh, and it is it hasn't found anything that's predicted by string theory yet. Um, it could have, but it hasn't. So like particles that string theory predicts, uh, indications of higher dimensions, it hasn't found anything yet that detect that. Um, my money is on uh, on astronomical events, cosmological events. I mean, if you need such a high amount of energy to detect the presence of strings, and we cannot, because of lack of technology, generate that much energy, then maybe we should observe catastrophic astronomical or cosmological collisions, for example, when black holes collide. They generally generate enough energy that if we manage to get close to them, we can maybe get some indication of these things that we're looking for strings and higher dimensions and so on. Um, and and um, gravitational waves have just been discovered a few years ago. And uh, it's, I always think of gravitational waves as, uh, as, as a, the beginning of a new kind of astronomy. All our astronomy is based on electromagnetic waves. You detect light, you detect radio waves, you detect x-rays. But detecting gravitational waves is new. So maybe that would help um, either prove or disprove this, this idea of theory. In a sense, I don't know. So there, there may be hope for experimental verification. So the current future of this string theoretic proposal of the theory of everything can be one of two things. Either there's a lot of Nobel Prizes in the future, or a lot of homeless strict theorists. <laughs> <laughs> That's all there is to it. Thank you very much.
500 different ways to wrap things down from 11 dimensions down to 4. Right? So each time you wrap, there, these manifolds that represent the small dimensions, there are many of them. There's a, I mean, almost an infinite number of those possible manifolds. But a subset of them is large enough that when you do a dimension reduction, you can get any number of theories depending on how you did the process. And nobody has actually counted them, but it's an estimate. That's all there is. So, Either we have found a non-unique theory, or there is a multiverse that has described by each one of these, as Suskin has proposed. Nobody knows. But the math is fun. Yeah. So following on that, would these 10 to the 500 different universes, would they be essentially identical in a sense, or would they be represented by different fundamental each values one different of them, fundamental constants? Each one of them would have a completely different set of so then there is some way within here to determine which subset of those 10 to the 500 would be ours. Would be R. That has not been found yet. We don't know what that is. So we don't know, we don't know of the exact these... way to dimensionally reduce okay. string theory to, to give us the standard model algorithm. Okay. Exactly the standard model algorithm. That has not yet been found. All that has people been able to prove is that the strings provide a way of Particles with certain mass, charge, and spin yeah. that can be explained by electrons and photons and so on. But the exact way of dimension reducing the action of string theory from 11 dimensions down to 4 that gives exactly the standard model is yet to be found. Mm -hmm. Especially supersymmetry thrown in, because it cannot give you exactly the standard model. It will have to give you a supersymmetric version. It's a big fat mess. Yeah, it sounds like Oh, yeah. Oh, it's trust me. No. My question was uh, going to the uh, particle collider. Yes. Since it costs so much and we weren't able to use it to get an answer from it, what else is it used for? Well, it, 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 it was found, uh, a lot of research comes out of it. For example, the Higgs particle was found in the LHC, right? And um, there is something called the anomalous magnetic. Um, magnetic moment of the muon that has been discovered there too that may open up some fields of research and um, hundreds of PhDs are written based on experiments done in the, in, the, in the HC hundreds of thousands of research papers have come out since it opened in 2008 or 2009 um, so it's still useful but it's, it just hasn't been useful enough to touch upon the idea of, of strings okay. it's a tool I mean, it's like, it's like saying we invented a microscope, right, to try to find a certain bacterium. But we haven't found that bacterium, but we found hundreds of others, and we've written research papers, so it's, it's been useful. I don't want people to think that the LSG is just for the same theory. No, it just happens to be the strongest instrument we have right now. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Um. I, I may have missed it, but do we know why it takes on a string-like shape? Like, why a string? Yeah, good question. Um, um, I, there was a proof, there was a mathematical proof that the string shape is the only shape that would be, would not violate any rules of physics. People tried to form um, non-string-like objects, but it didn't work. So we don't know why the string shape is the only one that works, but it is the only one that works. And there is mathematical proof that you cannot make it any different and still get something that resembles the laws of nature. So you mentioned earlier in your talk that there's two types of strings. There's the open-ended open one and then the closed one. I was wondering if you could talk more about what the closed string represents. And then two uh, related to that is, when, 
I think most particles that like you represented here in your pictures of the electrons interacting, you would kind of represent by the open strings. Yes. Okay. No, no, no. Actually, I showed closed strings Feynman diagrams, but open strings Feynman diagrams are, uh, are similar. They're just sheets. Instead of world lines, they're world sheets. Okay. So, the question so, what do the endpoints of the string represent? Good question. Excellent question. Um, First of all, closed strings have modes that represent the graviton. The graviton, which is the particle of gravity, can only be found in closed strings. Open strings have endpoints, and you can apply ordinary boundary conditions on them, Dirichlet and Neumann, in the usual sense. When you do so, you discover, you see I have a picture of that here, you discover that the endpoints live on invisible surfaces, that satisfy certain criteria. And these surfaces that later was developed into the brains, the end brains. But physically, would the, the one end point of the stream be it's like the birth of that particle? No. no. No, physically the whole string is the particle. And it's so it's the stream plus the brain. Can no? Yes, but if the brain happens to be our universe. Yeah. That means that open strings are attached to our universe. They cannot travel to other universes. Because they can only live on this kind of thing. So how would you, if you thought about a particle decaying, splits into two strings. So it splits, so, okay, so we have a string and then it bifurcates yes. at some point. And yes, it exactly right. Like this one. Like this picture. This one. So this represents two particles getting close to each other, they combine into one particle, and then that's one particle decays into two. Uh -huh. Like this, two particles combined. This is a third particle, and then they split into two other particles. Uh -huh. And then you can have any kind of possible Feynman diagrams for any of these interactions. So the universe then is a big kind of tapestry of all these streams yeah, colliding instead of and separating instead of particles. Instead of particles. Okay. So, yeah. And they all follow certain rules. The fermionic strings, the bosonic strings, and, and you can't, and, and when they interact, they follow pretty much the same rules as the ordinary particles. It, last question for me. When we think about quantum mechanics, we think about particles spreading out, right? And the uncertainty principle saying that, well, if you give a particle time, you're going to be less uncertain of its position. How do you think about that with strings? Do the strings get fuzzier in time or broader in time? Well, you can treat it the same way, but strings are relativistic, which means you have to treat them with a quantum field theory approach rather than ordinary non-relativistic quantum mechanics approach. And there is this way of dealing with strings that assumes that there is a string field, and every string is a quantum of that field. It's called string field theory. Just as in, in, in the standard model, there is the electron field and quantum excitations of it gives you electrons. But, so you quantize again. But how would you represent like, the spatial uncertainty of a particle? The same way as you would uh, in the sense of, uh, of particles. I mean, you would have um, certain delta x's and delta p's and everything. We can derive those if you want. I mean, then, I mean, I'm not aware of anybody working with that because things are always traveling in the speed of light. Um, but it's possible to, well, not all is traveling in the speed of light, of course, they acquire mass with interactions with the Higgs string. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but, um, but at the end of the day, um, you, can, you can treat it quantum mechanically just as you would ordinary quantum mechanics. But you have to slow it down mm -hmm. considerably. Any other questions? You said earlier that all particles are on a single oscillating string, but you talk about them in the plural. Yes, I mean that one type of string. Okay. One so type one of string is just a filament of something. Nobody knows what exactly. It's just a fundamental thing. <laughs> and um, there's a reason for this. And the way it oscillates represents a particle. There are an infinite number of strings. That's what I'm saying. It's a very large number of strings. Okay. But they're all the same type. And the way they oscillate is how you observe whether you're seeing an electron or a photon. And a string cannot just spontaneously change into something else. It follows the same rules of particle physics that one would expect. You can't have an electron suddenly becoming a photon. It has to interact with something and a photon comes out. Strings follow the same rules. Thank you. Yeah.
You can do particle physics with strings with the same rules, baryon conservation and all kinds of things that you find, charge conservation, all kinds of stuff. Wow. There's no further questions. Let's thank Mohitaz again. Thank you guys. <laughs>